items. Next is discussion and possible vote on warrant article to acquire two sand pit road. So after this discussion, it would be a motion to direct staff to work with town council and the board council to develop an article. So that is what is tasked before us is the approval to work on an article to authorize the purchase and borrowing for two sand pit road. So Jared, if you come forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jarek, we're all DBW director, and tonight we do have with us Emily Beebe is also at the meeting, and Brian Massa, our consultant, consultant with uh, Horsley Witten, is also here. So as you all announced a while back, uh, the town was considering purchasing uh, uh, a portion of Noon's Two Sandpit Road, and currently after doing environmental investigation phase one and phase two, and doing going through the appraisal process, the price had come out to a little bit over six million dollars for the 23 and three quarter acre land that is out there for that parcel. And I believe it also includes the roadway into the sand pit, and um, also part of Noon's Drive that abuts to Sand Pit Road. The abutting road would also give us a secondary access into that property if this were to go through. So we'd have two ways to get to Sand Pit. It's important to note that while we were looking at this and. Due to the erosion we've had lately, I couldn't help but think about, okay, so if the town were to purchase this area, this 23 acres or so, and the fact that we have to purchase sand now to do dune replenishment and beach nourishment, I worked with our consultant, Brian, who is here tonight, and said, Brian, hypothetically, if we're going to do excavation of five feet of 23 or so acres, what would that come out to as far as value to us? And we discussed it a bit, but the estimate value of sand at that area is a little over $2.7 million if you were to hypothetically excavate five feet of that 23 acres. We broke it down into square feet, $15 a cubic yard value for that. Brian is here to answer any questions. Emily is also here. And anything else you all want to ask about uh, the phase one or phase two, uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Anything from the board? Sure. So the first phase really is just the visual inspection of the property. Anything that comes up that would look hazardous to that property, the investigator would just dig in a little bit more, ask more questions. It's also kind of a tabletop exercise with any documents that we have in a parcel file for that area or any documents that could be found with DEP. So all of that's research first. The second phase really is soil and water tests. So what we did was 11 or 12 test pits on the property uh, for soil testing, and we uh, did install three monitoring wells there, one on each corner of, of the parcel. During the soil investigation, the results came back. There was nothing that really triggered any kind of regulatory compliance items with the soil testing. In the monitoring wells, there was one that, that it showed above drinking water limits, PFOS. And they happened to be, that particular well happened to be on the east side of the lot. So everything down gradient of that, the other two monitoring wells were kind of downflow of that one that did not show any signs of PFOS in it. It was below drinking water limits. That being said, reviewing this with Brian and looking at the amount of PFOS that was in this one well and not seeing anything down gradient of there, we needed to determine directional water flow for this to determine whether or not that is the source or it's coming from somewhere else. So with that investigation also being done, we were able to determine that it's down gradient status that the town would have to declare after taking purchase if it passes that town meeting. There's also a couple other pieces of this because we're able to disclose this tonight. The reason why we can talk about this tonight, and we've all talked to town council a bit, is that this information about the PFOS being there was not disclosed to the town by the current owner, is my understanding. I could go on, but if anybody has any questions about that. Jared, thank you for the update on that. Does the level two investigation, which uncovered the existence of PFOS, or otherwise known as the forever chemical, did the testing also test for volatile hydrocarbons? So I'd like to turn the, the testing questions over to Brian so we can get into it a little bit more and he can talk about down gradient status as well. And he can kind of give a quick summary of the testing that we had done with the water and the soil for you. Thanks, Jared. So we installed 11 test pits at the site and we collected nine soil samples from the test pits and we tested them for PFAS, for volatile organic carbons, SVOCs, metals, extractable petroleum hydrocarbons, PAHs, and PCBs. So we, we tested them for, 
for pretty much everything that you would think of. Uh, we also did the same testing for uh, groundwater, except we didn't do PCB testing because we didn't find it in the soil. Thank you. So would it be helpful to show the diagram of the uh, monitoring wells, Absolutely. test pits? Sure. So Brian can bring that up now so everyone kind of get an idea of where that PFOS was located and where the other monitoring wells were, which are downgrading of that along with the test pits. While you bring that up in preparation for this meeting, I did some sand research and there are a couple facts that I want to bring up for the public to consider because we're going to be talking about PFAS, which is a forever chemical that's kind of scary. But then also I just wanted to share some research I found about sand. So according to a 2002 United Nations report, sand is the second most consumed resource on earth, surpassed only by water. And just like water, humans are consuming sand at an unsustainable rate increasing by 6% every year to be exact. And then sand is a critical ingredient in our material world. Our cities are literally built on sand. Sand is a key ingredient to cement and asphalt, roads, buildings, bridges, and foundations. None would exist without it. While well, we're talking about PFAS, we're talking about our concerns about water and potential development on the site. I also don't want to lose sight and compartmentalize the value of the sand. All right, continue. All right, so this is the sampling figure uh, that I just pulled up. So you can see the test pits, they're the squares there. We did 11 of them, as Jared said. Uh, we collected soil samples from nine of those. Uh, we did field screening during excavation. The test pits went down to about 10 feet. We did visual observations to see if there was evidence of any buried debris. We did field screening every two feet from all of these locations, and then we selected samples from various depths to be representative and to be biased high if there was to be contamination in there. As Jared said, all of the soil samples that we had collected didn't exceed any of the most stringent regulatory thresholds, which in Massachusetts is the RCS1, which is a residential value. So none of the soil samples exceeded any of those thresholds, including for PFAS. PFAS was not detected in any of the soil samples. It was all below the laboratory detection limit. The monitoring wells that you see, those are the blue circles. We installed three of them. Three of them are required to determine groundwater flow direction, which Jared had indicated we needed that to determine where groundwater was moving at the site. We collected groundwater samples from each of these wells. They varied in depth. They were all five feet into groundwater. I want to say they were between 20 and 70 feet below grade as how deep those wells went. We collected groundwater samples from all of them. We collected samples from MW1 twice. That's the one that exceeded for PFAS. That's the hydraulically up gradient side. So if you see groundwater is flowing across the site, it starts up at MW1 and then it flows down towards MW2. The PFAS exceedance were found in MW1. And then as it traveled uh, across the site towards MW2, the concentrations dropped where there were still detections, but they're less than the regulatory thresholds. We also tested the wells for VOCs, for petroleum hydrocarbons, for multiple other contaminants, and there was nothing else that was detected above regulatory thresholds above the drinking water standard, which is the GW1 standard. That's the most stringent standard in Massachusetts. What Jared was alluding to earlier, downgrading and property status, what that means is that a property has been affected by a release, but the property itself is not the cause of the release. So as you can see, the parcel outline here is what the town is looking at for their parcel. We did a phase one investigation and we did a due diligence search. We identified no known releases at the site. We did a subsurface investigation to verify those observations. We didn't find anything indicated that the site itself was the source of a release. So what downgrading and property status means is that you're a property that's been affected by a release that's not occurring at your property and you're hydraulically downgrading to it. So the fact that you see these impacts in groundwater at the furthest hydraulically upgrading edge of the property, which is MW1, which is where groundwater would be coming onto the property, and then the concentrations don't increase, they actually drop, meaning that the property itself isn't contributing anything to it. That's a regulatory submission to Massachusetts where you submit this paperwork and you say that there's been detections of contaminants in the groundwater, but this particular site is not the source of it. When DEP gets that information, they would look at it and determine if there's potential interest in the sites that are hydraulically upgrading into that parcel, if they're the potential source of the PFAS. I also want to add that this is an earlier diagram that we had used for the site visit. The top parcel that is outlined in red is the 23-acre parcel. The one below that is a separate parcel. That's not what the town would be purchasing, but we were allowed to do test pits in that area anyway.
Appreciate it. Thanks for the clarification. Any questions? Yeah, Sue. So, thanks, Jared. You may have said this, and I, I missed it. You talked about excavating a certain amount of sand in a certain area. Mm -hmm. How much of an area? Did you say five acres? So, if we were to take that 23-acre parcel that's the top there outlined in red that's 23 acres so hypothetically if you did take 23 acres of that where the topography is today and excavate down five feet all of that 23 acres that's the 2.7 million dollars value in sand and that's approximately 191,000 cubic yards or so just over that I'm sort of related, but not, and I don't, I'm not going to put you on, well, I am going to put you on the spot, but you don't have to answer. Do you know what we spend on sand, like average annually, just to give a little perspective? So we use sand for, for nourishment, and typically we have our stockpile ahead of the meadow. So I have not purchased sand for any nourishment yet. We will this year. Our stockpile is pretty much tapped out. We can't get any of our beaches. Parking lots are clear, so we won't purchase sand this year for the first time for nourishment. But for snow removal, we do purchase sand. And our snow removal budget, which we'll, you'll see later, right. is different every year. And that cost of sand is, is something that goes up year over year. And that can be anywhere from 10000 in one year in sand, depending on snow, up to as much as sixty in one year. And some of that dollar amount you see in that budget in your packet later on down also is salt mixed into that cost as well so right now we do purchase sand for snow removal this is the first year we're going to actually do it for nourishment and we're going to spend twenty five thousand dollars this year on nourishment and that's going to be for the pam and arbor jetty and for beach point any questions from my colleagues all right if there's no questions i will entertain a motion Madam Chair, I move to direct staff to work with town council and bond council to develop an article to authorize the purchase and borrow of two sand pit road. Do I have a second? Sergeant. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? I think it says it in the packet, but I just want anyone who's watching to be aware that this is an article that would have to be approved by town meeting. Yes. So. Yep. Thank you for clarifying. All right. Sue? Aye. John? Aye. Bob? Aye. Stephanie? Aye. Kristen? Aye. All in the affirmative. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your time and for being here. And while that we uh, spent a quick time uh, moving this along to have staff work with town council and bond council, this board has met several times to discuss this in executive session and work with the Noons family. And we have walked the property and we have had lots of discussion about this. And it is our responsibility to create a warrant full of articles that go before the legislative body for them to make a decision. So while that seemed like a quick meeting uh, agenda this evening, I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion around town about this, and we'll still be hearing from our constituents about it, and I would be willing to have another agenda item if there are constituent concerns and people want to ask more questions and potentially be open to a forum. So this is not the end of the select board's discussion about this, but because of mass general law, we've been held to certain confidentiality standards, and so we had to respect that through our executive session, but this is just a, a step in a long process. So I just want to clarify that. I think that once we have an article prepared, the public would really benefit if we did something well before the pre-town meeting. Absolutely. Uh, so that people can come in and ask questions. I think that's really important. Absolutely. To be able to talk about SAND and PFAS, and this is not an insignificant number, and so there will be much future discussion on this. So, and each member has to decide if we're ready to, to recommend this after an article has been created and presented to us. So there's lots of time to make decisions. Our, there's lots of decisions that have to be made in the remaining time. So thank you very much.